Okay, I think it's time to get started. Uh, so this is our last lecture of the semester. After this, there are no more lectures. We're going to finish virtual memory. And then if we have time, talk about epilogue and some future directions in architecture. Uh, but after this, you'll prepare for the exam, I guess, and continue your whatever is left of your labs or extra assignments. So we will release uh, some things for you to study for the exam. Uh, we will communicate about that uh, later on via email. You'll have a lot of study material for the exam for sure. Okay, so let's continue uh, virtual memory and finish. Uh, virtual memory never ends, <laughs> so it's impossible to finish virtual memory in my opinion, but we'll finish at least the basics and interesting parts. There's a lot more that's interesting. This is an idea that's been around for 60 years, and in the end, we'll spend a little bit of time to critically question it because uh, it's probably not the best uh, uh, way of managing memory going into the future as memories become larger, you have different types of accelerators sharing the memory, etc. So, and you will see some of the reasons, uh, hopefully, toward this lecture uh, within this lecture. Okay, you know, there's an extra assignment uh, to get easy credit on. We're going to talk about that hopefully uh, toward the end of this lecture. Uh, and you have some readings which have not changed that much recently. And recall, virtual memory is really uh, providing uh, the illusion of a large separate address space per process. And this is a nice picture uh, that I like using. Essentially, each process is its own virtual address space, which is large. And then uh, physical memory is small. Uh, and uh, you have this uh, indirection and mapping mechanisms that map the virtual address space of each process to portions of the physical address space. And there's a management system that ensures that the programmer doesn't need to deal with managing the address space, virtual address space, uh, managing the physical memory uh, uh, in any of the programs. And this provides a lot of benefits like we discussed last time. So I'm not going to go through all of those benefits again. Some of them may appear uh, during the course of this lecture, but certainly this illusion of large separate address space is helpful and it's maintained using indirection and mapping between virtual to physical address spaces. And we discussed what is needed to enable that uh, indirection and mapping and that's the page table. Page table is very interesting because page table enables address translation. We've, we've seen multiple examples. Again, I will not go through these again. And it exists uh, as part of the operating system and the hardware is aware of it. Basically, this is part of the contract, this is part of the ISA, essentially. The ISA specifies it, as we will see uh, with some real uh, pictures and cop uh, copy paste from ISA manuals. And we wanted to solve some issues with this page table. And one of the issues we tackled was the page table size, right? We said this page table actually can be quite big if your virtual address space is large uh, and uh, your page uh, granularity is small. Small is four kilobytes, four kilobytes is small, even one megabyte is small 
uh, uh, with a 64-bit virtual address space, right? So basically, we calculated the size of the space table, assuming this sort of system. And we saw that it's 16 petabytes. And we said that it's not possible to have this in physical memory. So we solved this problem by introducing another level of injection, which is essentially first level and second level and end level or multi-level page tables or hierarchical page tables. It's also called hierarchical page tables, uh, as we have discussed. Essentially, you only need to uh, store only the first level page table in physical memory. Everything else can be in virtual memory. And you basically uh, bring the page tables that you need into the physical memory whenever you touch those, that part of the virtual address space and you need translations for those parts. Makes sense, right? So a page table is enabling translation. If you don't need a translation, you don't need a page table. If you don't need a translation in that part of the virtual address space, you don't need that page table to be brought into the physical memory, essentially. Okay, so that sounds good. Hopefully you're all on board with these. Sounds good? Multi-level. And you can also read your book because this is also in your book, as you can see. Now, I was also giving you examples from multi-level page tables from the x86 manual. We actually went through this. Essentially, this control register three is the page directory base register, which is a physical address. And only this page directory table, which is essentially a first level page table, uh, it needs to be in uh, physical memory and everything else can be in virtual memory. But you can see that you need to translate this to get uh, to another page table and index it using some other bits in the linear address or virtual address uh, to get to the uh, page address or translation. This is the page table entry, essentially, and this gives you the physical page number that corresponds to that virtual page number. Okay, uh, so there's nothing magic about this and you can actually put numbers. These are real uh, numbers uh, from x86 if you use 32-bit virtual addresses. But x86 is actually a very flexible architecture. Uh, it has a lot of baggage because of its flexibility. So you can actually have uh, larger pages as well, four megabyte pages, for example. If you use four megabyte pages, then your page level, page table doesn't need to be hierarchical, as you can see. Right? It's only single level because your uh, uh, your page offset is very large, as you can see, and your directory uh, or meaning uh, the virtual page number is actually small. Right? Okay, but x86 is even more flexible. You can actually have 48-bit addresses, and you can have a four-level page table walk. We've seen this uh, yesterday. Uh, this is not the worst, actually, as you will see soon. So, but I want to make sure that uh, this is very clear. This is. Uh, the reason virtual memory is a hardware software construct is all of this needs to be specified in this book, which is the ISA, which is, as you can see, at some point, it was 4,830 pages. You will see another version with 5,060 pages. But this is a, a picture that I showed you in lecture eight or so, where we talked about ISAs. And I said virtual memory management is part of it, right? Access control mechanism, priority privilege, task thread management is part of it. And this is the 5,060 page version of it which is one year later, <laughs> or one year or so later. And there's a specific uh, portion of this ISA. These are actually multiple volumes. One portion essentially is about system management, so a system programming guide, right? This is where the uh, system architecture is specified. Pa page table is an example of it. This is what the operating system designer needs to know when they write an operating system, for example. Uh, how do they manage the tasks and threads, as well as virtual memory? And this particular uh, manual is this volume three, as you can see, and it by itself is 1,500 pages. Now you can see some parts and parts of it. Chapter two is about system architecture. Chapter three is about protected mode memory management, paging. There's a, a chapter dedicated to paging. I think this has 50 chapters or so, but it's big basically. And this is actually specified in the ISA. And this is part of the problem. This is a very rigid uh, specification. It's like a specification of instruction, right? This is what the page table looks like. These are the entries, as you can see, right? If you have four megabyte pages, page directory entry looks like this. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, for, uh, page table entry for a four kilobyte page looks like this, basically. This is the address of the page frame. This is essentially the physical page number. And these are the uh, different addresses, address of the page table, as you can see over here, right? And then there are some other bits that we're gonna look at. One of them is the valid bits. So one means valid. So if it's valid, that means that the translation is valid over here. You can either go to the next page table address or uh, the physical page number, as you can see over here. If it's zero, that means it's ignored, then you need to get a page table except page fault exception, right? And we've also seen that we're gonna see more of that. But the purpose of showing you this here is, this is part of the ISA. Somebody put this up over there. And if you want to write an operating system that does virtual memory management properly on that architecture, you gotta build your page table this way. If you build in some other way, 
you're not obeying the ISA and the processor is designed to actually look at these bits in a particular way. We're going to cache these bits in TLVs, for example, soon. Uh, the processor is designed to actually do the page table walks in hardware. You don't have to do them in software. We're not going to talk about that, but uh, you, you will see that maybe in future courses. Essentially, if you don't design your software obeying this, your hardware will not work on whatever you designed. If you don't design your hardware obeying this, the software will not work on the hardware you designed. And that's basically, this is the interface over here. It's not an instruction, as you can see. Instructions operate on these memory structures. OK, so if you go into the specification, clearly there are specifications. We're going to see this again, but uh, uh, present is the valid bit, essentially. x86 has a nice naming strategy. I like the present name also, present absent, right? Uh, OK. And then there are a bunch of other stuff that we will see soon. Some of these are for access protection uh, that, I, that we will talk about. Okay, so this is actually the five-level page table structure that x86 has. There's a five-level translation as well to in increase the address space. But you can see that you first need to get this page table entry. If it's valid, that's good. Otherwise, you get a page fault over here and then bring the page table. And then you need to translate this one, the second level, the next level, which is the fourth level over here. If it's valid, that's good. If not, you get a page fault over here. And then you translate this one. Uh, well, one of these, actually, depending on how, how large your page is. Ignore the one gigabyte page over here. Uh, look at this one over here. Essentially, uh, you get the address if it's valid. And then you go to the next level. You get the address if it's valid. And then you go to the next level. Finally, this gives you the uh, uh, physical page number. So if someone asks you uh, a question, how many page faults can you get when you're tr actually trying to get the physical page number of a load that has a virtual address, it could be a lot. It could be five, actually. And that's to fetch the instruction, potentially, to fetch the load instruction. That's a virtual address, the PC. And then when you actually execute the load, you calculate another virtual address, and then you can get five more page faults over there. Right? That's 10. This is all assuming that you don't get a page table entry at the boundary of a page. If you're at the boundary of a page, you may actually get two page faults to service something. That, I think, doesn't happen in x86 architecture unless you have some serious misalignment issues. Uh, but it could happen in some other architectures. It used to happen in Vax, for example. So you can actually get lots of page table, uh, page faults uh, in this. That's why you actually want to not uh, 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 traverse this page table. That's, what, that's why we're going to introduce the next idea uh, very soon. OK, but uh, just to give you an idea, these are the four kilobyte pages in x86. These are the two megabyte pages. And these are the one gigabyte pages. So you can actually have huge pages in x 6 And even one gigabyte pages, as you can see, require two level page tables with a 48-bit address. So if your virtual address increases, your page table, uh, uh, your, your multi-level hierarchy also increases. Makes sense, right? OK, so this is one of the reasons pay, uh, it's, it's very difficult to scale the system into very, very huge memory sizes. If you have petabytes and petabytes of memory, it makes it's a lot of inefficiency, basically, that you have in this translation. So people are looking into how do you actually do this in a much more efficient way. OK, so we solved the first challenge. I actually added a little bit more uh, just to give you an idea of what uh, this is really about. Uh, uh, so we solved the page table is large challenge using multi-level page tables at the cost of additional indirection, additional latency. Now let's talk about this latency issue, right? So basically, the second challenge is whenever you do address translation, each instruction fetch or load or store requires at least two memory accesses, assuming you get the translation whenever you access the page table, right? And assuming non-hierarchical page tables also. Basically, one memory access for address translation, you read the page table, and then want to access the data with the physical address after translation, right? This is the good case. But in the bad case, it could be lots of page faults also, as you can see, right? Uh, so, with a hierarchical page table, that two goes to maybe four, five, six, seven, right? Depending on uh, how many levels you have. But let's assume it's two. Even two is bad, right? You don't want to access memory twice to actually get the instruction. And then you don't want to access memory twice to get the data that the instruction needs, right? You want to access memory once to get the data immediately. So basically, this is a problem. Two memory accesses to service and instruction fetch or load store greatly degrades execution time. Uh, and number of memory accesses increase with multi-level page tables, as we just discussed, unless we're clever. Basically, this is where another part of the hardware comes in. Uh, hardware accelerates this translation process using special caches. So we're going to introduce a special cache. It's called the translation look-aside buffer. How many of you heard about this? 
in the past. Okay, you're hearing for the first time, that's great. You'll hear more in the future perhaps. But basically it's a cache. Uh, it's like it's caching the page table entries in a hardware structure in the processor to speed up the translation. That's the idea. All of the principles of a cache apply here. TLB, essentially it's a small cache of most recently used page table entries. In other words, recently used virtual to physical translations. It's a PTE cache, in other words, page table entries, right? It reduces the number of accesses, memory accesses required for most instruction fetches and loads and stores to only one TLB access. So it can be a very small, right? It can be small and you access the structure and you get the translation immediately. You don't need to access memory at all anymore because you cached the, the translations there. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> it's a specialized cache because you do need to do this translation. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so basically uh, the reason it works is the reason why caches work. Because we have spatial and temporal locality in uh, translations, in page table access essentially. And you can imagine why, right? You basically are streaming through memory, let's say, and you've allocated, uh, you, you, have, you have a large page, let's say. In that large page, clearly that translation is used many, many times. If you're executing lots of instructions in a sequential manner, they all belong to the same page. Right? And then assuming that the next page is allocated in the physical consecutive page in memory, you have, uh, well, next page is actually in the next, page is actually in the, uh, next uh, virtual memory address, right? So basically, if you're going through the sequentially, you're basically going through the virtual memory address space sequentially, though the translations actually have locality as well, spatial locality as well. And temporal locality, because you have many uh, instructions uh, accessing the same uh, data in the same page or instructions in the same page. Okay, so this is the reason basically, because memory access have temporal and spatial locality. And large page sizes clearly exploit spatial locality better, just like we saw in caches large block sizes. Remember that picture that I showed you yesterday? Page is equivalent to block. Essentially, uh, if you have a gigabyte page uh, and if you have very good spatial locality, uh, your TLB hits most of the time, right? Okay, and consecutive instruction and loads and stores are likely to access the same page. We already discussed this. So TLB is a cache of page table entries. In other words, translations. It's small, it's accessed in a few cycles. Typically it's multi-level also. We have multi-level, we have a hierarchy of TLBs also in existing systems. So we have a hierarchy of caches as we have seen, and we have a hierarchy of TLBs. One of them handles the data, the other one handles the translations. You may say there's a lot of waste and I agree, <laughs> that's true, but that's the cost of making life easy for the programmer basically. So typically at level one, you have 16 to 512 entries and usually it's high associativity and you get typically nine to nine, nine percent hit rates, but it all depends on the workload, right? It all depends on the access pattern. If you're completely accessing memory randomly with no locality in translations, then you get zero percent hit rate in this cache and it's basically terrible. Okay, so hopefully you get the benefit of this, right? This reduces the number of memory accesses to only one TLB access. You don't need to access even physical memory or the page table. Page table resides in physical memory, but you don't need to access it because you already cached it whenever you use the translations. Okay, so let's take a look at an example, two entry TLB. This is uh, the like toy example from your book also. It's essentially a two entry cache, right? So what do you do? Uh, essentially it caches a translation. It caches the page table entry. Here we're, we don't have the access control bits. It's actually you normally caches the access control bits, but your book simplifies things. Essentially we have two entries, both of them are valid over here. Uh, and uh, one of, uh, essentially the translation looks like this in each entry, you have the virtual page number and the corresponding physical page number. And in the other entry, you have the virtual page number and physical page number. So this is caching two page table entries for two different pages and you know which pages they are. And if the processor is trying to access this virtual address, it consults this TLB, accesses the TLB. And basically you can see that this is a two way or fully associative cache in this particular case. So it basically searches the virtual, tag num virtual page number it's looking for. And this is essentially part of the tag uh, in the TLB, right? And uh, in this case, there's a match on entry zero over here or way zero, if you will. And you get the translation or you get the physical page number concatenated with the offset that doesn't get translated as we've discussed yesterday and you get the physical address, okay? So instead of doing the page table access, we replace it with the TLB access. If you miss in the TLB, if you don't have the translation, the TLB, then you do the page table access that we, we saw yesterday. And then when you do the page table access, you access the page table entry and you bring it into the TLB, right? That's the idea. Just like you would cache data, you're caching page table entries in this case. Okay, no magic. 
Okay, basically everything we discussed in caching and prefetching lectures apply to TLBs. You can have instruction or in data TLBs for exactly the same reasons why we have instruction and data caches. Uh, you can have multi-level TLBs for exactly the same reasons why you have multi-level caches. Uh, you have associativity si and size choice and trade-offs. Again, for similar reasons, you can apply insertion, promotion, and replacement policies. What do you keep in which TLB and how to decide that? You can prefetch into the TLBs. You can assume that you're striding through memory, and you, you can actually go and walk the page tables and get the translations early. Uh, and this can actually work together with the prefetcher, in fact. Uh, and you need to keep TLBs coherent if they're in different processors, if one of them modifies the translation for some reason. Uh, because the operating system may be running on it. You need to keep it coherent in the other processors that may have cached an older translation. Uh, and you can have shared or private TLBs across cores and threads. But everything we said applies here. It's just a cache, except it's caching something special, translations. But because you've taken this course, you know that there's nothing special, right? Everything is bits in the end. You're caching bits, and you need to make sure that those bits are satisfied correctly. We're just assigning meanings to bits in this particular case, and that meaning is a translation. OK, so clearly, we're not going to go into this. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, you can actually watch uh, more detailed lectures that uh, talk about an example uh, of how modern processors work. We won't have time to do that. Uh, we'll release that lecture. You can take a look at it. But modern processors, uh, uh, translation hierarchy is actually quite complicated. There's also hardware page walkers. So actually, this walk uh, of uh, in x86, for example, uh, whenever you need to do the translation, whenever you need to get the translation, there's a specialized engine that is essentially walking the page table to figure out where the translation is. So you don't do that using a program. You do it using a specialized hardware accelerator inside the x86 processor. Sounds fancy, right? And this is one of the first accelerators that's added to the system, actually, before a lot of other accelerators. Uh, this came close to around, around the floating point times, basically. They added the floating point accelerator, and they also added the virtual memory accelerator, if you will, because virtual memory is so important. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, examples uh, uh, before we uh, end this part of the lecture. Actually, I have a lot of interesting things over here, so we're not done yet. But, but as I said, virtual memory requires both hard hardware and software support. Page tables and memory, it can be cached in special hardware structures, as we have just seen. And OS and hardware both know the page table organization and structure through the ISA. The hardware component is called the MMU. If you hear this term, it's the memory management unit. It refers to actually the hardware component, everything that's in hardware. It's not just the TLB. It refers to the page walker uh, and then also the page fault handler, as we will see. Uh, well, a part of the page fault handler, I should say. OK, but it's the job of the software. The operating system is to use the hardware to populate the page tables decide what to replace in physical memory. So we're going to talk about some of these things also. And the change the base tab page table base register on a context switch, right? Because when you context switch to some other process, you should really change the translation hierarchy, essentially. And that uh, happens by changing that CR3, for example, the page table base register or control register 3 in x86, so that you can use the correct page table. And it needs to handle page faults and ensure correct phys virtual to physical mapping. Again. A lot of these are done also cooperatively between the hardware and software, but it's the responsibility of the operating system because the operating system is the one that's executing the page fault handler, for example. And page fault handling is special because it's an exception. It's an exceptional condition. The process uh, 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 gets a page fault. And normally, if you remember the exception lecture, we said that exceptions are handled at the priority of the process. This is not the case here. Here, you escalate privilege so that you can, ex uh, you can actually handle the exception because the page tables are very important, as we will see soon. Uh, you cannot enable the user to uh, change it. If you enable the user to change, that's a huge security problem. Uh, basically, you get a page fault. Uh, the operating system needs to kick in and basically uh, ensure that the page fault is handled in a secure way uh, so that the mappings are changed without any problem. Right? Because if you change the mapping in a wrong way, Either the process will access wrong data or process may access some other data that it does not have, it doesn't have, have permissions to, as we will see. Okay, uh, so a page fault is a special exception, basically. Uh, okay, user cannot handle it, I should say it that way. It's the context in which it is handled is the system, not the user. Okay, so address translation, uh, we've already seen this, so I'll go through this relatively quickly, uh, but basically this dictates how to obtain the physical address from a virtual address. Page size is specified by the ISA. There could be multiple page sizes, as you can see today. Uh, this actually causes issues in 
how to organize the TLB also. Do you have multiple different TLBs for different page sizes? Now you have a problem, right? <laughs> so if you're interested in this, you can watch the additional lecture. We don't have time to go over this. So basically there are trade-offs in the page sizes, similar to trade-offs we have in caches. And page table contains an entry for each virtual page. Uh, basically it's called the page table entry. Then the question is, what is an PTE? Let's take a look at that a little bit. And we've already said that page table is a tag store for the physical memory, right? Data store. Uh, it provides a mapping table between virtual memory and physical memory. And page table entry is really the tag store entry for a virtual page in memory. So we need a valid bit as we discussed, right? This indicates validity or presence in uh, physical memory. You need tag bits. These are the physical frame number or physical page number bits to support translation. You need bits to support replacement, which we're going to talk about soon. What do you replace from physical memory if your physical memory is full? So you need to know which pages are not touched. But this actually is a problem because we have so many pages in physical memory, as we will see soon. You need a dirty bit to support write back caching in physical memory. And we've discussed this already because write through is pretty expensive in physical memory. You need protection bits to enable access control and protection. Now, this has nothing to do with address translation. <laughs> this is basically added to the system because the system is capable of doing more than address translation. So this is completely orthogonal to address translation. You can actually use something else for protection, but today virtual memory uh, 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 functions, uh, uh, serves two functions. One is access protection and the other is address translation. And we'll see this more. So this is my uh, nice handwriting. You'll see better pictures perhaps, but uh, basically I already said all of this. Okay, so we call address translation. We've already seen this, so I'm not going to go through this. This is the general address translation form. You get virtual page number to translate to physical frame number. And uh, you have a separate page table per process. So we've covered all of this. So let's move to something that we have not fully covered. So address translation, you may get a page hit. So if you think about the MMU, MMU can be a structure that includes TLBs. Uh, that does include TLBs, actually. You send the virtual address to MMU. MMU somehow responds with a translation. And if it's a hit, meaning it either hits in the TLB or the page is in physical memory, meaning it's, uh, there, there's a page table entry that's valid for that virtual hit, can be classified as TLB hit and TLB miss earlier, uh, as we discussed also, right? So basically, in this case, there's no page fault. Everything is good. Uh, you get the translation after either a TLB access or a TLB access plus multiple memory accesses to get the page, page table entry. Now let's, say, let's talk about page fault. This is not what we, is something we have not talked about so far. Let's see how it's handled. So you, uh, the processor sends the virtual address to the memory management unit. It misses the TLB. It misses the, uh, uh, basically in the end, when you figure out the translation, the translation doesn't exist. Either one page table uh, doesn't exist that you're looking for, doesn't exist meaning isn't present in physical memory because it's present in disk somewhere. Uh, or uh, basically that the real page that you're looking for isn't in physical memory. So you need to handle the page fault in this case. Essentially, valid bit is zero. There's a page fault exception that's triggered. Uh, once a page fault exception is triggered, a page fault handler kicks in. It first, assuming the physical memory is full, it first evicts uh, some dirty page out to the disk, for example, assuming it's going to replace that. And then handler pages a new page and updates the page table entry in memory. And then it returns control to the original process, restarting from the faulting instruction that caused the fault. And hopefully that gets a page hit and hopefully a TLB hit because you filled all of those uh, when you handled the fault. So let's take a look at uh, how, how this is handled a little bit. So basically this is a miss in physical memory if you think about it, because physical memory is a cache of the disk. Uh, essentially page table entry indicates virtual page is not in memory. Access to such a page triggers this fault exception and we invoke the OS exception handler. Other processes can continue executing, right? This process needs to stop. But now you know about run-ahead execution. <laughs> so maybe you can actually do run-ahead execution software also. Actually, this is a real proposal. It's a beautiful proposal that, was, that showed benefits. I'm not going to go into that. So you can actually speculatively execute the process at the software level. If you critically think, you can actually apply a lot of the concepts that you used into software as well. Okay, so let's not go into that right now. But basically, OS has full control over page placement. So basically what it does is before fault, uh, the CPU is accessing this virtual page. It's on disk, it's not mapped to memory. After the fault is handled, the CPU is accessing the same page again. And now the page is mapped into physical memory, right? And the page table is fixed to reflect that. 
and something is kicked out from the physical memory, perhaps, right? Uh, okay. So uh, how is this serviced? Again, there's a lot that's involved here. Now we're going out to the system level a little bit more. Uh, if this course continues to, uh, in, the, in, in the next direction, there's actually a lot in the system level also to think about. But basically, processor signals the I.O. controller initiated by the operating system. Operating system basically tells the I.O. controller, I.O. controller, I want to read some block from disk. This is the address of the page table that I want from the disk. Uh, and we, I want to store it to memory starting at address Y, because that's where I want to locate the page table, right? Because I know the mapping, and I'm going to make sure everything works. And uh, there's a disk to memory read occurs, and this is usually handled using direct memory access. There's a setup that happens in the memory controller, and the memory controller automatically transfers from the disk, or disk and memory controller automatically transfer things to memory without involving the processor. This is one of the cases where we don't involve the processor, actually, because there's a lot of data that may be transferred from disk to memory. It could be one gigabyte, as we have seen, right, with a large page. So this happens under the control of the I.O. controller. And eventually, this finishes. Uh, the controller signals completion, and it interrupts the processor, saying that operating system, I'm done. So you can actually resume the process that, you, uh, that faulted on this page. And the operating system fixes all of those mappings and resumes the process. Makes sense, right? So you can clearly see that this can take lots and lots of microseconds, milliseconds. Actually, milliseconds are more. So you don't want page faults in your system, basically, the takeaway. <laughs> OK, so let's talk about page replacement algorithms. Uh, if physical memory is full, you have a problem at hand. Now you need to actually uh, replace one physical frame because you, you're trying to bring some other physical page uh, into the physical memory, right? Uh, so how do you determine physical memory is full first? Usually you have a free list of physical pages. These are operating system data structures. Operating system actually keeps track of these. Uh, you can potentially cache these in hardware, just like we've been caching stuff in hardware. Uh, but essentially, uh, it's possible to uh, keep track of these. So of course, we've done this exercise before. Is Trail, are you feasible? We said that it's not feasible even in caches, right? Uh, or small caches. Now let's take a look at the size of this cache. I'm going to take one terabyte memory because this is almost reality today, right? Uh, we're going to have one terabyte memory soon. One terabyte is how much? Is it two to the 40 bytes? I think so. Yeah, per, per, tera, peta, exa. OK, tera is two to the 40. Four kilobyte pages, small pages, two to the 12. So essentially, uh, we have two to the 28 pages. How many possibilities for ordering there if you want to actually do a perfect LRU? Now you know the answer by heart, two to the 28 factorial. Now, that's a huge number. You can probably figure out what that number is in terms of and write it down, but it'll be a <laughs> waste of paper, let's say. Uh, essentially, it's a huge number. So modern systems, again, use approximations of LRU for two reasons. One of these reasons is this, and the other is LRU is not a perfect uh, predictor of future anyway. Right? So uh, I'll introduce the clock algorithm very quickly, because the algorithms here need to deal with 2 to the 28 pages, right? How do you figure out which one should you evict? Whatever heuristic you come up with is actually not so easy to implement in the end. So clock algorithm is very clever, uh, but there are more sophisticated algorithms that people develop. Actually, usually it's a more sophisticated algorithm. This is a nice algorithm from IBM that was published about 20 years ago now. Uh, it's uh, adaptive replacement cache. Uh, they call it cache, but it's really managing the physical memory. Physical memory is a cache, as you know. So what is clock algorithm? Very quickly, uh, it's, it, it resembles a clock, basically. Essentially, uh, you have all of these pages in physical memory. Imagine two to the 28 of them. I'm showing you some small number over here. And this is one of the nice pictures I could find. <laughs> uh, but basically, clock algorithm has all of the pages like this. It points to one page uh, uh, at some point, let's say. And uh, let me actually uh, say this. You keep a circular list of physical frames or physical pages in memory. OS does this, of course. Uh, and it keeps a pointer or hand to the last examined frame or last examined physical page in the list. When a page is accessed, uh, the clock algorithm sets the R referenced or accessed bit in the PTE for that page, saying that I recently accessed this page. OK, that's good. Now, when a frame needs to be replaced, this clock algorithm kicks in, and it replaces the first frame that has the reference bit not set. And it finds this frame by traversing the circular list starting from the pointer going clockwise. So if you look at this example, we're pointing to 0. This is not set. That's the reference bit. So you replace this one, OK, if you need to replace something. 
And then uh, you change the clock algorithm to this one, okay? And then this is not set. If you're going to replace, that's going to be replaced next. And then uh, it, this will point to one over here. It, you're not going to replace whatever is one. So you go and find the first zero. Makes sense? Basically, the goal is to find the first non-accessed or not recently accessed page, physical frame. So during traversal, while you're traversing this, if you're skipping uh, some page that has been recently accessed, that is a bit set to one, you set it to zero. Meaning I've seen this page, uh, it's recently accessed, I'm not gonna replace it, but because I have gone through it, I'm gonna set it to zero saying that next time I see it, if it's still not accessed, I'm gonna replace it, okay? And of course, you're not gonna get to that for a while, assuming you have two to the 28 pages to go through with the sand, right? Okay, so this is a very rough approximation and it's been used in early Linux uh, kernels. Variants of it are still used, uh, frankly. Uh, and then you set the hand pointer to the next frame in the list. Makes sense, right? So this is clearly an approximation so that you don't replace the recently accessed uh, pages. And again, there's an interesting thing over here. There's an arbit in the PT, page table entry. This is also specified by the ISA. The ISA basically specifies an arbit I will show you in, in x86 called the ABIT access bit. And this, is, this needs to be set. So how do you set this? You set it in the TLB. How do you propagate the entry to the uh, page table uh, when you actually set it in the TLB and you need to replace something in the TLB? You need to write to the page table. So they're actually really interesting things of management over here. And when you write to the page table, you need to do memory accesses, right? Okay, so keep things in mind. This is, this, uh, these things complicate uh, memory management in general. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to make life easy for the programmer, but we're adding a lot of memory accesses while doing that, as you can see, right? Okay, so th there are differences between cache, uh, like hardware cache versus page replacement. Physical memory is a cache for disk, as we've seen. It's managed by the system software via the virtual memory subsystem. Page replacement is very similar to cache replacement. Page table is a tax store, as we've discussed. The difference is uh, essentially uh, multiple. Uh, the required speed of access to the cache versus physical memory. So this page replacement can be slow. It doesn't need to be very fast, if you will, because caches require cycles, uh, accesses, uh, that needs to be as quick as cycles. Here, we're talking about bringing the page from memory all the way into, uh, from, from disk all the way into memory. You can have your sweet time to figure out what to replace, right? Because that's going to take at least microseconds. Okay, so number of blocks in a cache versus physical memory. Hopefully, we've seen that. I just give you an example with two to the 28 blocks in physical memory or pages. So this makes a, a complicated physical uh, memory replacement algorithms are not easy to implement. Uh, I think we've already discussed this. It's similar to the first one, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. And then the role versus, of hardware versus software. Caches are hardware managed because the latencies are low, but this is mostly under the control of software. But as I said, it's accelerated in hardware. Okay, any questions? I'm going through some, th some of these relatively quickly. There's a lot of complexity in the system actually, but if you watch the lecture that talks about uh, what is done in a real system, I give Intel Skylake as an example you'll see there's even more complexity than what I'm talking about. That's one of the reasons why we believe as researchers that this needs to be rethought completely. But of course, the difficulty of rethinking something that has been around for 60 years is not easy. Because the infrastructure has been developed for 60 years, programs have been written this way. If you actually do something completely different, it's going to be not easy to adopt, right? Okay, let's talk about the memory protection aspects uh, of, uh, page, uh, of virtual memory. And I like this part because I get to talk about Rohammer here also, as you will see. <laughs> uh, but this is actually interesting because uh, memory protection is necessary, right? Multiple programs or processes run concurrently. Each process has its own page table. Don't ever forget that. Each process can use its entire virtual address space without worrying about where other programs are or what they're ac accessing. This is beautiful, right? A process can only access physical pages mapped in its own page table cannot overwrite the memory of other processes, basically. And this enables essentially isolation, right? You're isolating processes from each other. And it provides protection also. But protection has other categories also, because within a process, you may be able to read a page, but not write it, right? Within a process, you may be able to read and write a page, but not execute it necessarily. So you have different permissions on a per page basis. For example, uh, uh, if you don't uh, want your programs to be modified, you can have read access to the code, but not write access to the code, right? If you don't want uh, 
someone to execute uh, right to some place and uh, execute the, uh, that data that will be interpreted as interest instructions when you jump to it, you basically mark it as non-executable, right? Uh, so basically, you can enable access control mechanisms per page uh, this way. Okay, so remember page tables per process, we've seen this. Uh, so essentially, access protection and control can happen also via virtual memory. And this is called page level access control or protection. Uh, essentially, not every process is allowed to access every page. For example, you need supervisor level privilege to access system pages. An example of a system page is a page table. All of those page table structures are system pages. As a user, you should not have any access to it. Right? Otherwise, you can change your permissions to access anything. Right? Uh, for example, you may not be able to execute instructions in some pages because you're not allowed to execute that code. Right? Uh, and the idea is to enable this is to store access control information on a page basis in the process page table and enforce access control at the same time as translation. That's the idea. It works nicely because that's when you really need to enforce access control also. When you're trying to access a page, you also need to translate it. And assuming you have permissions, translations, you can proceed with translation. If you don't have per permissions, don't even proceed with a translation, right? Basically, virtual memory system serves two functions today. One is address translation to give you the illusion of large physical memory, and the other is access control to give you memory protection. And this is my uh, nice picture. Essentially, when you're doing translation, you also bundle access control with it. And in fact, access control takes priority. If you don't have access, forget about the translation, right? You don't need the translation. And if, you have, if you're trying to access a page uh, that you don't have the proper access to, you'll get an exception immediately. It's called an access protection exception in some systems. Essentially, you get kicked to the operating system and the operating system basically tells you stop, the, this usually stops the program, right? because it's trying to access something, it's, it doesn't, it's not allowed to access. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is an example. We extend the page table entries with permission bits. This is a very simple example, right? In addition to the translation information, we have read write permission bits. And then of course there needs to be valid bits, et cetera. Right? Okay, so different processes have read and write access. You can see that they're sharing physical page six over here. It could be a shared library that they're executing. It could be some shared data. Again, it needs to be set up through the uh, operating system to be able to do that. Uh, and they may not be sharing some other processes. For example, uh, physical page nine uh, is not accessible by this process. And you may have read write permissions to some of these pages and uh, uh, not write permissions to some of these pages. So basically it depends on the specification of the ISA again, what you can do. So uh, there are privilege levels in x86. Uh, usually, again, I don't have time to go over this in detail, but there are these levels that you may see they're not necessarily the best architecture for protection. This is old, uh, let's say. But just to give you an idea, usually at ring zero, you have the supervisor level, highest level operating system has this privilege. And usually user applications are at the lowest privilege, right? User. Supervisor is kernel in modern terminology. It used to be called supervisor in the past. Okay, so let's take a look at these page directory and page table entries uh, a little bit more closely. So if you look at, uh, this is a, uh, a page directory entry in x86. This is the first level. Uh, page table, uh, you get the address of the page table and you have, you have a bunch of bits over here. So this is the address of the page table and these are the flags. You can see that one of them is read writes, one of them is user supervisor. You have the same thing over here at the PT also, read writes, user supervisor. So now you can actually have protection at larger granularities also. So at the larger granularity of uh, a huge page table, uh, as opposed to a page, you can specify uh, user and supervisor level privilege as well as read write accesses because of the multi level nature, right? So, this multi level nature enables also multi level access control, if you will. Uh, it gets hairy a little bit, as we will see. Basically, this PDE protects all 1024 pages in a page team. You can see these are the bits that I mentioned over here read writes, whether you have read permissions or write permissions, or user and supervisor permissions. Whereas PTE protects one page at a time, granularity is smaller over here. Okay, and this is basically the specification of the ISA. Now you can see how messy this gets a little bit, right? Basically, uh, depending on what you have in the page directory entry and page table entry, there's a combined effect of whether or not you can access. And you can look at that over here. Again, I don't have time to go over this, but basically this is what the ISA specifies and the operating system needs to obey it and the hardware needs to obey it, period. <laughs> if they have specified it wrong, too bad, fix the ISA somehow, right? Okay, so uh, any questions on this?
I'm not suggesting this is the best architecture for protection, but this is what we have in common systems. Usually ARM has its own protection mechanisms, which is slightly better, but not too much better if you ask me. Uh, this is what we do today. Uh, there could be better, stronger protection mechanisms that are a lot more costly to implement. Let me put it that way. Now, what if, now I'll talk, let's talk about raw hammer. <laughs> uh, what if your hardware is unreliable and someone can flip the access protection bits? This shows how flaky some of these access protection is, as we will see. And this is also going to have some implications on how important some of these issues are, in my opinion, such that a user level program can gain supervisor level access, in other words, access to all data on the system by flipping the access control bit from user to supervisor. That's one way to do it, right? You somehow flip the access control bit on your page table entry to supervisor and you have access to your page table because this page table entry may be pointing to your page table. Right? Makes sense. I'll, I'll give you an example. Can this happen? Well, since you know about Rohammer, <laughs> you know that this could happen, right? So basically, you can predictably induce errors in most DRM memory chips. And we already talked about this. Let me give you uh, the idea very quickly again, and then I'll show you a security attack that actually takes over the system by taking advantage of these bit flips. So basically, the issue was whenever we activated a row, uh, we uh, would apply high voltage to it. Whenever we precharge a row, if you remember from DRAM lectures, we would apply low voltage to it. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly in the memory controller by accessing memory, you would get bit flips in pages that are adjacent, physically adjacent. Right? Clear, this should not happen. You can say that this is bad, data corruption, blah, blah. But this is actually a security problem also. Uh, and as we discussed in an earlier lecture, uh, we said that most DRAM chips are vulnerable. Actually, all DRAM chips are vulnerable today. So let's take a look at an example. This is a user level example. When we first published the paper, we actually put this code online. And then later, Google actually took this, improved it, et cetera, as we will see. This code, what this code does is, it essentially hammers X and Y, address X and Y. It selects address X and Y in some way. They map to the same bank and it avoids caches to act X and Y, flushes X and flushes Y from the cache and it avoids row hits to X and Y by reading Y another row. Basically, we, we got to get rid of the cache caching right, in the system. How do you get rid of the caching? By flushing uh, these cache blocks that you're touching in rows X and Y and also getting rid of the row buffer by opening different rows in the same bank. So basically what this program does is this. It keeps repeatedly accessing uh, rows X and Y. Sounds good, right? You can actually try this program if you want. I'm curious if it still works. There are better programs out there today. Uh, this is 2012, remember. <laughs> okay, so you get bit flips. And these are real bit flips. Uh, they are reproduced in real life. And uh, now we're going back to how it's related to memory. So if you look at the paper that we wrote in 2014, it says memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. And virtual memory actually ensures this, right? Virtual memory is great because it ensures this, but unfortunately virtual memory is powerless if you have a bit flip at the underlying levels like this, right? So we said in this paper that someone can hijack your computer if someone is maliciously trying to take advantage of these bit flips. And these folks from Google Project Zero essentially did this. Essentially, they took the program that I showed, they improved it, they made it better, and they wrote this blog post. I'm, I have a copy paste from this blog post, and they also uh, published a, a talk that you can watch their video in the Black Hat conference in 2015, uh, where they said that they tested a selection of the laptops and they, re they replicated the issue that we uh, discussed, and they built two attacks. One of them is taking over the Google native client, not so interesting. The other is actually doing attack on the virtual memory subsystem, as we will see. Essentially, uh, this is, these are all their own words. They use row hammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges on x86 for Linux when run as an unprivileged user land process. So they were able to uh, induce bit flips in page table entries. And uh, they were able to gain write access to the own page table of the user level process. And if you gain write access to your own page table, you can change anything you want, right? So that's the idea over here. Uh, so let's take a look at how they did it actually, because now you have, I think, the background to understand this, at least at some level. Uh, these are their slides. Uh, they basically say, uh, essentially, what we've said earlier, right? Page table entries are dense and trusted. They control access to physical memory. A bit flip in a page table entry's physical number can give a process access to a different physical page. Aim of the exploit is to get access to the page table. Write access, I should say. <laughs> Read access, okay. You cannot do too much with a read access. Write access, you can do a lot. 
and gives access to all the physical memory if you do that. And they, they want to maximize the chances that a bit flip is useful. So they're actually going to introduce a special attack. It's called page table spraying. They spray the physical memory with page tables, and they do it in a clever way, as we will see. And they check for useful repeatable bit flip first so that they can actually exploit this. So this is the page table entries that they exploited. Basically, it has 64 bits over here. And they basically say if they actually target the, this read write bit, the chance of bit flip is low, right? Basically, the chance of a bit flip landing here is 2% because that's one out of 64. Whereas if they target the physical page base address, which is the physical page number, let's say, essentially it's 20 bits. So you get a 31% chance to be successful to have a bit flip over there. So there, it's a probabilistic attack in the end. And these are, again, their slides. You can watch their talk as well. So let's see what they did, basically. So this is the virtual address space. This is a physical address space. We should be very familiar with this injection right now. So they say, what happens when we map a file with read-write permissions? This is what happens, basically. The file gets mapped to memory, and it has a virtual address. And then the file, uh, the bits of the file is in physical memory, actually. But it, does th it happens through an injection, which is a page table. Those red entries are page table entries that map the virtual pages of the file to the physical frames in physical memory. Sounds good, right? OK, so what happens when we repeatedly map a file with read-write permissions? You get more page table entries. You get more page tables, essentially, because this is the same file, yes, but these are different processes that are mapping. Or different. Uh, whenever you actually map the different files, it acts as if you have different page tables that are needed because they need to be. They, they actually you, you you modify them using different streams, if you will. So basically, you get many many page tables in memory, right? Pointing to the same physical frame over here. Okay, basically, PTs and physical memory help resolve virtual addresses to physical pages. This is their words, and they can fill physical memory with page table entries. So most of physical memory is page table entries. Now this is good. Each of them points to pages in the same physical file mapping. So all of them point to this green part over here. Now, if a bit's in the right place and the page, in the page table entry flips, the corresponding virtual address now points to a wrong physical page with read-write access, because we opened the file with read-write access. We're able to write to this. So this page table entry tells us, whenever we access this virtual address, this page table entry tells us, you can write to this part of the file that's cached in physical memory. That sounds good. But if, if I do a bit flip, by doing a row hammer attack, I can actually flip the bit in the physical page number in the physical page table entry over here to somewhere over here. So I gain access to some page table entry over here because I sprayed the memory with page table entries. That sounds good as an attacker, not as a defender. Uh, basically, chances are this wrong page, uh, page contains a page table itself, which is true because you sprayed most of the memory with page tables. An attacker that can read write page tables can use that to map any memory read write. Essentially, you have control of many page table entries over here, and then you can actually do whatever you want to the system. You can change the operating system if you want, right? Basically, you become root at this point. Makes sense, right? So, okay, so to make this a working probabilistic attack, uh, they basically say you need to do other stuff also, like allocate a large chunk of memory, figure out which locations are prone to flipping due to, due to row hammer. And then check if they fall into the right spot in a PTE for allowing the exploit. So they don't want to leave it to 31% chance. They want to actually see where the bit flips are. You can actually figure that out. And then return that particular area of memory to the operating system. So as a user, you can actually learn a lot about memory and then return to the operating system. And the operating system allocates a page table entry over there later. right? And then you exploit that. And then you force the operating system to reuse the memory for PTEs by allocating massive quantities of address space, like we discussed earlier. And then you cause the bit flip. Uh, using row hammer uh, that shifts the page table entry to point to the page table and then abuse the read write access to all of physical memory. At this point, you are root basically. Clearly, in practice, there are many complications as they see. So, that's essentially what uh, uh, row hammer circumvents, as you can see, right? And there are many, many attacks that are developed. This is the first attack that shows us, but there are actually people have automated some of these attacks uh, today. Okay, so I can talk more about row hammer, but we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> Uh, but I, I will tell you that there are a lot of other attacks. Uh, we don't have time. And this is actually some works uh, that introduced both attacks and defenses in 2023. There are sessions on Rohammer in the Security and Privacy Conference, for example. Uh, OK, so if you're curious, there's a lot uh, that's being written over here. You can read papers. Solutions that were developed by industry doesn't work, which we don't have time to talk about. I'll refer you to a lot of lectures over here. 
Uh, it's hard to guarantee Rob Hammer feed chips, actually. This is a technology scaling problem, and industry adopt solutions are actually quite poor. We will talk about that. But these attacks are actually, industry is also introducing attacks, like Google itself introduced this uh, half double row hammer attack. So it's a little bit different from the original row hammer attack. What they do is you have the victim rows over here, and you have an aggressor row that's uh, not immediately adjacent. Basically, they hammer this adjacent row that's a little bit farther. There, there's another row in between. They hammer this a lot, they hammer this little, and they cause bit flips in the victim. This basically shows that their row hammer effect is getting worse in the physical uh, memory. And it's also interesting for other reasons that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, but Girai is sitting here and he can talk to you a lot about that because he's been doing a lot of work on Rowhammer and he's one of the authors in this paper, as you can see. Okay, so uh, the good news is industry is developing solutions to this. This is actually uh, finally, uh, like nine years after the original Rowhammer paper. This is a paper from SK Hynix that uh, was written in ISSCC this year. They basically say, we're trying to solve Rowhammer. <laughs> yeah, you can see how they're trying to solve some of these solutions resemble the solutions that we have proposed in the past. And similarly, Samsung has written papers also, and they modify the DRAM basically. They modify the DRAM to be more intelligent to try to detect these attacks. And this is a paper that was written by Samsung doing something similar, much harder to read paper, let me put it that way, uh, but essentially solutions similar to what we have been discussing. So are we now row hammer free? Let's see. <laughs> There's more coming up, as you can see. We're gonna present this work at ISCA. Uh, I believe there's even more that's going to come up. Uh, I think it's not gonna be easy to get rid of some of these issues. And it's, 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 it's going to be harder, act, harder and harder to actually prevent these bit flips in a fundamental way. I cannot reveal the paper right now, but after ISCA, talk to me. So as you know, I talk a lot about Rowhammer and some of your uh, creative stu uh, fellow prior students realize this. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a lot to discuss here, including some of the solutions, but I don't have time. But I, have to, uh, I had to put it in the virtual memory lecture because it actually brings together multiple concepts, right? So let me, uh, I'm going to use a, a few more slides and then conclude, and then we're going to take a break. But basically, this actually opens up some really interesting things. Rohammer actually opened up a lot of hardware security research. Essentially, if hardware is unreliable, your higher level security and protection mechanisms may be compromised completely, right? This basically indicates that the root of security and trust are actually at the very, very low levels. If you don't have some security at the very low level, then you're not going to build secure mechanisms at the higher levels. So you can do as much as you want at the operating system level. It doesn't matter because somebody, someone will cause a bit flip in some way and circumvent those mechanisms. Right? Basically, the root of security is really in the hardware and the physics itself. And Rohammer, Spectre, and Meltdown are recent key examples. I don't cover Spectre and Meltdown. You actually have the background to think about Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, uh, because you know about caches, you know about speculative execution, you know about branch prediction, all of those, but it's more complicated than Roll Hammer. It's harder to exploit also. So then the question becomes, what should we assume the hardware provides, right? How do we keep the hardware reliable? Should we assume hardware is completely unreliable and build mechanisms of trusted execution on top of it? That's another approach. This is possible, but it comes at very high costs. It comes at checking, for example. Every time you access a page, you check whether integrity is compromised or not. And that's expensive, basically. And for that, you need some hardware support also. So how do you design secure hardware? How do you design secure hardware is not a difficult question if it's just that. It's a difficult question how do you, if you actually want high performance, high energy efficiency, and convenient programming at the same time, and low cost. Actually, if you add any of those, secure hardware and high performance, they don't go well with each other. <laughs> secure hardware and low cost, they don't go well with each other. That's the problem, basically. So basically, there's plenty of exciting and highly relevant research questions over here. And if you're interested, there's more in future courses. Now, let me summarize virtual memory. Uh, I think this is a good place to summarize virtual memory and talk about some challenges. So essentially, virtual memory gives, you, gives us the illusion of infinite capacity, infinite in quotation marks, because you're still limited by the virtual address space size. But hopefully, that's large enough. Uh, you have a subset of virtual pages located in physical memory, and a page table maps virtual pages to physical pages. This is address translation, a TLB, and also a page walker speeds up address translation, hardware accelerators basically, accelerators specialized for virtual memory acceleration. And multi-level page tables keep the page table size in check. And using different page tables for different programs and having access control bits provides memory protection. This is virtual memory in one slide, let's say. There's more in virtual memory, but we will not cover them. Like how do you handle virtualized systems? I'm gonna show you another picture. This makes, the injection to a next level. This takes the injection to a next level. 
Like if you're running a virtual machine uh, on top of a guest operating system, or if you're running a hypervisor on top of a guest operating system, there is another level of injection over there, as you will see soon. You can have alternative page table structures that may be faster, that may be more useful. Again, we don't have time to talk about that. In fact, in replacement, I ignored an issue. How do you do the mapping from physical pages to virtual pages? You need actually some inverse mapping also to do the replacement so that you can actually change the page table entry. So physical table, uh, page table provides a forward mapping, virtual to physical. But if you're replacing something in the physical domain, you need the inverse mapping. When you replace the physical page or physical frame, you need to invalidate the virtual mapping, right? So you have another problem basically, which we kind of glossed over, right? We didn't even talk about it, but that problem exists and you need to solve it if you're writing an operating system. So people have come up with inverted page tables, for example, that's another overhead, as you can see. So that's one of the reasons why we think rethinking virtual memory is actually a good idea. Uh, maybe not so easy, but let's take a look at this virtual memory and virtualized environments. How many of you use virtual machines? Okay, that's good. <laughs> so many of you actually, if you submit jobs to cloud, you can actually run virtual machines or your machines here. So basically this adds another level of address translation. So you have a guest operating system, virtual machine, you have a host operating system and you have a CPU. Clearly we've looked at uh, a real machine, right? Real operating system. You have this address translation, but Guest also has a virtual addresses and it gets mapped to the physical addresses over here, which is essentially the virtual addresses from the perspective of the host over here. So you basically have another level of address translation over here. And existing machines to speed up virtual machine performance have hardware support for this multi-level translation also. AMD introduced it in 2006 or so, for example. So basically it's a mess as you can see, right? It's not that great, but we keep adding infrastructure to support it because it's so important. Okay, so uh, regardless of all of its shortcoming, virtual shortcomings, virtual memory is actually one of the most successful examples of architectural support for programmers how to partition work between hardware and software and hardware software cooperation in the end. And also the programmer architect trade-off. The trade-off is made so well that we keep adding complexity to our systems so that we ensure that programmers don't know about what's going on, right? <laughs> so in that sense, it's not, uh, it's not a good deal for the architect, let's say, but it's a great deal for the programmer. <laughs> okay, so going forward, how does virtual memory scale into the future? Basically, it's not going to scale easily. It's a lot of energy is actually spent on virtual memory address translation, a lot of cost, a lot of performance, et cetera. We usually ignore this cost. We don't even count it when we talk about it, right? So physical memory size are increasing, both local and remote. Uh, we have hybrid physical memory system, DRAM, non-volatile memory SSDs. We want to actually do that going into the future. There are many exercises in the system ac accessing and addressing physical memory. And we have virtualized systems, as we've discussed. And in the future, we already have some near-date accelerators and processing in memory systems which we may get a chance to talk about in the next part of the lecture if we have time. Let's see. But basically scaling, this is not easy. Again, we don't have time to go over it, but we are thinking of alternatives to the conventional virtual memory framework. I think this is a very nice direction to think about. I don't have time to talk about it, but this completely rethinks the virtual memory subsystem. You get rid of the uh, virtual memory abstraction and make, try to make it more flexible, if you will. It has a lot of downsides. Clearly it has a lot of issues that need to be solved still, but, uh, virtual memory has been around 60 years and new alternatives have been popping up maybe once every 10 years or so. So we need new alternatives to this. And if you're interested, you can actually look at uh, the lectures uh, related to this. So you can see this actually lists some of the challenges, like rigid page table structure is actually pretty bad in my opinion. Uh, we need to fix that somehow, but let's see what happens. So there are more lectures on virtual memory. We don't have time to talk about. Uh, but as I said, we'll release one lecture if you want to go into more detail about a real system, how it does virtual memory, and you'll see even more complexity over there. Any questions on virtual memory? Let's see how bad we are on time. Okay, not so, not so terrible, but not <laughs> so good also. So let's take a break until uh, 28, uh, and then we will have a brief conclusion. <laughs> And if you have questions on virtual memory, feel free to prefetch them right now. <laughs> Just a quick question. Sure.
Okay, I think it's time to be back. We're almost done. This should probably be just epilogue because we don't have time to talk about the rest. <laughs> if you're interested, you can watch a lot of lectures online, of course, but uh, yeah, I don't think we'll have time to cover the future computing architectures part, but I've given you glimpses of it, hopefully during uh, different lectures, right? We talk about processing in memory, for example. That's a very exciting area right now. Uh, we talked about some prefetching examples using machine learning to improve prefetchers. So there are a bunch of interesting things that can be done today. Let's see if we can get uh, there. But uh, I wanted to use the remaining time to wrap up just to give you an idea of what we've done in this course. And uh, of course, the course didn't end yet, but the lectures will end uh, today. Uh, learning never ends in the end. You always learn, right? Uh, you're always a student. It doesn't matter if you're a professor or, uh, or a king, you should always be a student, I think. Uh, basically, this was a slide that I put up uh, in the first lecture, right? Uh, and I think, I hope we uh, accomplished a lot of it. Uh, I hope this red part is also uh, important, uh, hopefully enable you to develop novel out of the box designs and different way of thinking, right? Again, I'm not going to go over the slide again. You can, you've seen this before, right? But if you have questions, let me know. So why, do, why did we have these goals? Obviously, we discussed this yesterday also because you're here for a computer science degree. It's kind of embarrassing to tell someone, oh, I work on magic. <laughs> I don't know how this thing works, right? Hopefully, if someone asks you how a computer works, you're not going to be embarrassing that, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's more like, oh, I know how it works. I don't know all the details, but here are the basic principles, right? <laughs> so that's the beauty of being a computer scientist, I think. You're a little bit different from someone who takes this as magic. And there are enough people who take it as magic in the end, right? And it's probably fine if they take it as magic. They don't call themselves computer scientists. <laughs> now, if they call themselves computer scientists, that would be a problem probably. <laughs> okay, yeah, but basically, uh, hopefully uh, the course has enabled you to think uh, differently. Uh, these are some of the goals, or hopefully it'll be useful uh, to enable you to design better hardware, software systems, make better trade-offs. I think that's very important. And I think more importantly, these three are more important. Hopefully it enables you to solve problems better, think critically, right? I think that's, I cannot emphasize that more. So we've come a long way just to give you an idea of what we've done. We start from the transistor as a building block. Remember that lecture where we had the most transistor? I said that I'm not going to go down below that abstraction level. We did break that abstraction level a little bit when we talked about speed, energy, et cetera, very briefly. But if you want to, go, you can go beyond that abstraction level also, figure out what, how a transistor works. There is a whole new world out there underneath, right? Now, right now, transistor may be a little bit magic, but you know, at least that's not a terrible building block to start from. And then we built up the virtual memory and system software mechanism right now. Now you actually, you, you have an example hardware security attack and you have an idea of why that attack works, right? Hopefully. You don't know exactly how to construct the attack, but you're not that far from it also, right? You know the basic principles. The rest is coding a lot of hard work <laughs> to figure out how it actually is constructed, right? And then in the meantime, we covered the logic design, uh, execution models, ISAs, microarchitectures, and many different execution paradigms and their trade-offs. And then the memory system, uh, which is perhaps the single most important thing over here, right? <laughs> memory system, memory system, memory hierarchy, caches, prefetch. So basically, let me give you a couple of takeaways. Essentially, all we covered is real and used in real systems. Basically, 
everything we covered is real. I mean, not everything, of course, literally, but every topic we covered is used in real systems at different uh, levels. And some of them may be used 10 years down the road, right? The reinforcement learning based prefetchers, for example. I strongly believe that they may be used 10 years down the road. Uh, and it's increasingly important. And hopefully you see the importance of that. And principles we covered apply broadly. Caching, prefetching, hierarchies, they apply broadly to many systems, actually. Uh, it's not just hardware. It's not, uh, basically, a lot of the systems actually have this, uh, these principles. We said that they even apply to humans, right? You exploit temporal and spatial locality once in a while, even though you fool me with random accesses too sometimes, but you're not that bad, let's say. Uh, and then hopefully the most important thing is this one, trade-off analysis and critical thinking that you're exposed to apply even more broadly, right? That's, I think uh, that has to be uh, gathered in courses, engineering courses especially. Uh, this is that, because in the end, uh, what we do is solve problems. And how do we solve problems is uh, using trade-off analysis and critical thinking, right? And that is what leads to creativity in uh, this direction. So just to make you proud a little bit, essentially these are some slides that I used uh, earlier. We were done with this, right? This is at the end of uh, branch prediction lectures. We basically covered a bunch of microarchitecture, pipelining, uh, precise exceptions, out of order and super scalar execution. So uh, these were more microarchitecture parts, although we touched the hardware software interface as well. And then we covered a lot of paradigms, execution paradigms, if you remember, these were microarchitecture as well as software hardware interface, ISA, and some compilers too. And we uh, had the slide uh, where I asked you, maybe you should think about the trade-off of these different processing paradigms. We covered some of these, but there's a lot to think about over here, right? Whenever you're designing a system, it's always important to think about trade-offs. And then finally, this is a new slide, uh, we covered this, uh, which ended today. And uh, we spent a lot of, well, not a lot, but six lectures, uh, but six relatively intense lectures, we should say. Uh, now you're hopefully very familiar with the memory systems. Uh, and again, there are trade-offs also in different memory system designs and ideas. And hopefully you see also the complexity as well, right? The complexity of the memory system is actually huge. The complexity of the processor is large, but the scale of the memory system and the complexity is much, much larger, if you've seen, right? Uh, and Hopefully, if, if you weren't convinced until today, hopefully you're convinced today with the address translation mechanisms that we added, right? Okay. So uh, essentially, it's good to also keep thinking about how do these trade-offs span and affect the hierarchy. I said in an earlier lecture that uh, I'm not going to take the narrow view of computer architecture. We're going to try to take the expanded view, although we had to cover the narrow view so that you can actually get to the expanded view, right? Uh, you have to learn the basics so that you start figuring out how to break the rules in the end and create new things. Uh, so it's good to think about how do these trade-offs affect the hierarchy? Uh, because we made some choices, for example, in virtual memory today, so that we don't affect the hierarchy at all, right? <laughs> Meaning the programmer doesn't get disturbed. They keep writing programs, uh, thinking there's some magic going on. Uh, but there's a lot of overhead in the system. If you actually calculate the cost of that overhead, it's expensive in the end. And is this the right thing to do is a good question to ask, basically. Is this the right uh, approach? Should I really expend so much energy on doing address translation? Should I keep optimizing the hierarchy, adding more caches and caches of translations? Who knows? Maybe not right. Especially when uh, things are changing. Things are changing in the sense that we have so many accelerators today, right? Maybe things should not be as general purpose going into the future. And we talked about that also, right? The spectrum of general purpose versus special purpose. Right? Okay, so uh, basically, this is what it's also what I said, right? Take this course as a learning experience, critical thinking, and decision making. Hopefully, the lectures uh, expose you to some of those. Uh, I think I've already said this, but this is a new slide, actually. So basically, I've given you a lot. We've given we talked about a lot of ideas that change the world and do the test of time. It's amazing if you look at some of these ideas. A, uh, a lot of them initiated in 1960s, 1970s, or so. Some of them evolved very little virtual memory. <laughs> Some of them evolved a lot, like prefetching, right? These are actually two lectures that we've seen very recently, but virtual memory didn't change much. Prefetching changed a whole lot, basically, over the course of 60 years. These were developed around the same time. Why? Because one of them really gets exposed to the programmer, right? <laughs> virtual memory. You basically set the stage, expose the programmer. Programmer uh, learned that they can be lazy, they don't do anything. And then they get used to it, and you cannot change that interface anymore. <laughs> Whereas prefetching, 
a lot of the innovation is in hardware. You don't, you didn't expose them to the programmer, so you can change it as much as you want, right? You can add reinforcement learning. You can add all kinds of fancy mechanisms like run ahead that we've discussed, right? And it will be more important going into the future, I think. Again, you may not all be future architects, but hopefully your development and thinking can greatly benefit from the concepts, trade-offs, principles, and critical thinking that we covered. Uh, I hope, I can only hope, right? Uh, but I believe that this could work. And uh, hopefully you'll focus on understanding, learning, and critical analysis going into the future uh, in your careers as well. I believe these are really agents for anyone's growth. Uh, and this course is designed to activate and help these agents, uh, frankly. And I believe these are lifelong principles. So I will give you a quote. It's not just me thinking this way. That's the good part. <laughs> I, can, I can find other smarter people who think this way. Does anybody know who this paraphrased quote is from? The value of a college education is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think. This is actually paraphrased heavily, but the gist is there. Anybody? Nobody heard this quote? Okay, nobody studies education here, fine. <laughs> you don't claim to study education also. If I give you this picture, probably you can guess, right? The actual quote is like this. It's not so very important for a person to learn facts. For that, he does not really need a college. He can learn them from books, right? And that's true. Today, actually, not books, right? Replace it with YouTube or whatever. And the value of an education at liberal arts college, I would remove the liberal arts from there, uh, is not the learning of many facts, uh, but the training of the mind to think something that cannot be learned from textbooks. And I think this is very really good to think about going into the future. Anybody want to make a comment or shall we move on to some other quotes? I like some other quotes also. Okay, now you have to get this one. Let me see if there's a side channel. There's no side channel. <laughs> Unless you go and look it up and you'll find out the quote. <laughs> so I like this quote. Uh, so this says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Does anybody know who this is from? This is from another Nobel laureate. Well, Einstein was one clearly, uh, but in a to totally different field. Einstein got that in physics, right? <laughs> this person got it in literature. And you may know that person. If you don't know him, read his books, <laughs> definitely, or plays. Uh, he's a famous Irish playwright. And he also says this, which complements this, I think. I don't think you should take this in isolation because you can be unreasonable and bad. <laughs> you can be unreasonable and good also. Uh, even unreasonable and bad actually leads to progress in the end, but it may take a long time to get to the progress. Uh, but unreasonable and good leads to progress faster, let's say. Uh, but basically, this is another thing that uh, this person said, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I think that's good to also think about. Again, I, I'm asking you to reflect upon this as opposed to taking this as a given. Okay, so what we did not cover. Uh, we did not cover a whole lot of things, and I don't intend to cover them also today. I may give you a glimpse uh, of this. Some of this is actually what we covered, and maybe some more suggestions, depending on how much time we have. So I'm not going to cover 200 slides in 19 minutes, clearly. Uh, so basically, computer architecture is very rich. I don't know why that YouTube link is there. Uh, there are many ideas, much creativity, many trade-offs, and many problems. So even if you con constrain yourself to computer architecture, there's a whole lot of interesting things to do, basically. And things are becoming more difficult and important as technology scaling, performance, energy, reliability, and security issues become worse in both hardware and software in the end. So it's already obvious in things that we have looked at, right? Uh, accelerators. Machine learning is an example, but there are clearly many, many accelerators that are going to happen, happening Genomics is an example, for example, that we're working on that's exciting, I think. Hardware security issues, new execution paradigms like processing in memory, processing in storage, processing inside the sensors, processing everywhere as opposed to just the compute part that we have looked at today, right? If you look at today, uh, if, you see, if you look at the course today that we have seen, we've constrained processing only to the processing unit, right? But I would like you to think about that I, I'd like you to break out of that, let's say, uh, box, because this is a box, unfortunately, we're in this box today, but that box is breaking. So we're putting processing units near memory today, for example. There are chips that are manufactured with compute units inside them, machine learning accelerated inside them, and also DRAM memory. I've given you some examples earlier. I may give some more if we have time. But basically, this is the uh, review that you did, uh, Intelligent Architectures for Intelligent Machines, right? That uh, review paper. I, I don't know. I have added the slide over here, but this may be the older version of slides over here. 
so let me give you some examples of what we're working on. Uh, but then I don't want to cover all of these at this point. But there, there's a lot to do, essentially. This is, in general, what we look at. But we're not limited to this uh, picture also. Uh, so essentially, the goal is to really build fundamentally better computers. And what is fundamentally better computer, right? Is it really making a better out-of-order execution engine? I would argue that that's no. Is it really designing a better caching hierarchy? I would argue that that's also no, right? Because we're talking about fundamentally better. Because fundamentally, there's some complete in energy inefficiency over here in the hierarchy, in the system design that we have done. For example, uh, what is a fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architecture, right? What is that? Should we be happy with virtual memory as it is? I would argue that not. Uh, should we not think about these bit flips that are happening, uh, which is going to happen increasingly more once you go out into the space at some point, if we can? <laughs> should we think about these bit flips in self-driving cars? So basically, I think it's good to think about these things uh, because this requires rethinking of what we have covered in this course. Now I'm deconstructing the course, let's say, right? You covered a lot, but if you critically think, maybe things should change completely. So energy efficiency is another issue, right? We, I've already said in this course multiple times, energy spent on the memory hierarchy. And then we built deeper and deeper memory hierarchies to spend more energy or to save more energy, but we spend more energy to access the memory hierarchy also, right? So it's interesting to think about this. Uh, like if you want to access a four level or three level cache hierarchy today, you expend a lot of energy, you expend a lot of time. So one of the works that one of my students recently read that got the best paper award at micro last year, meaning October, 2022, the idea is to predict which accesses are not going to hit in the cache hierarchy on chip, which accesses are going to miss so that you can start the access early and bypass the caches. Does that make sense? If you can do that, you don't need to wait until you access level one cache, level two cache, level three cache, memory controller. Basically, you bypass all of them and start the memory access early. So how do you do that prediction? Well, Rahul developed uh, perceptron-based methods, machine learning-based methods to do that prediction accurately at high coverage. Okay, so this sounds all good, I think. Uh, but is this the right thing to do is another question to ask, right? It's a patch to the existing system because maybe the existing system is wrong. Meaning why are we really having this huge cache hierarchy today, right? Maybe we should actually be doing computation on the other side of memory so that we don't need to build this cache hierarchy, right? We're building this cache hierarchy because we have to bring the data into the processor. But if you actually flip this around, you don't need to bring the data anywhere. Data is there, sitting there. I'm gonna send the instruction to the data. Then you're not moving the data, right? You're moving the instructions. And maybe this is fundamentally a much more energy efficient paradigm. And actually, I believe that that's the case. Of course, it's not easy to do because this requires a different programming model potentially. Uh, and also there are other issues. What if you're working on multiple pieces of data that are far from each other, right? These are issues that need to be solved. Uh, but this is the idea of processing near memory, being more memory centric, more data centric. Essentially, don't move the data. And we've already discussed this, right? Data movement is expensive, so don't move the data, right? If you ask this question to maybe a 10 year old child and ask the question, say, uh, oh, okay, data movement is expensive, what should I do? Maybe they will tell you, don't move the data, right? <laughs> don't touch the data, it's expensive. So maybe we should be thinking that way going into the future. This is the idea of critical thinking. It's more pure thinking in end, right? Okay, so there are other issues like low latency, predictable architectures. We don't really have time to talk about these things, but low latency and low energy are extremely important actually, uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, well, if you take, low, uh, if you take like uh, future courses, you will see some of these uh, uh, into the future. And then there's a specialization that we talked about. There are architectures designed, that are designed specifically for domains today. And these domains can be expanded, of course, but these can make a huge difference uh, going into the future. So if you look at this, I think uh, hopefully you will see that we really need to take a more extended view of computer architecture going into the future. That's what the specialization is doing, right? You're customizing the algorithm, customizing the architecture and designing them together, co-designing them. There's actually a lot over here. Like if you look at processing in memory, uh, any type of memory uh, has some analog computation capability. So these bit lines and word lines that we saw, whenever you access them, you can actually do some analog computation, bitwise AND, bitwise OR, bitwise XOR. In some memories, you can do bitwise matrix vector multiplication in analog domain using Kirchhoff's laws, for example. I'm not gonna go into this in detail, 
But this analog computation capability can be exploited if you can express your al algorithm to match that capability, essentially. It's a very different way of thinking from what we have seen, right? Von Neumann model, for example. Maybe it's a different, uh, maybe that model doesn't exist over there anymore, right? Okay. Okay, I think we've already seen this, so I'm going to skip this one. So there's a lot. These are some things that are going on in, in my group, but there's a lot more also that's going on that's not in the slides. But again, I'm not going to bore you with this one. If you're interested, you can read and watch a lot of things. And you can also take our seminar course. This was actually presented in our seminar course. Uh, let me give you three directions that are, I think, uh, interesting. You're going to read this if you want to get the extra credit, of course, uh, in the paper also, but just to make your life easier. That paper talks about three major things, right? Basically, data is a huge bottleneck. And if you want to design intelligent architectures, be efficient, be high performance, be secure, you need to handle data well in the end. So today, we're not handling data well. Uh, and I think there are three major reasons. One is uh, the data is overwhelming the components we design. And I just talked about this, right? You're moving the data all over the system. So why don't you keep the data stationary? Or when, you're sense, when you sense the data, do the processing on the data while you're sensing the data, right? When you have a camera, for example, uh, the camera does a lot of the processing as opposed to moving the data somewhere else, right? Of course, eventually you need to store it somewhere. But once you store it, do the processing inside the storage. Don't move it to a... A separate processor. Right? So basically, this is what the first one is talking about. Ensure data doesn't overwhelm the components by moving the data all around. Design intelligent algorithms, architectures, and system designs so that you don't move the data around. You operate uh, on data with as little data movement and as little computation also as possible. Right? Basically, be very frugal. Today, we're kind of spoiled because of the computational power that we have in our systems. We think that it comes for free, but it doesn't come for free. Right? It's expensive in terms of energy. So if you think about energy and sustainability, I think the newer generation is more interested in these concepts and they should be, in my opinion, because probably the existence of the world depends on it going into the future. You should uh, really think about the cost of the operations significantly. And the cost is, if nothing else, it's energy. You, cannot, you can eliminate perhaps a lot of the other costs. You can over, overcome the performance overheads by doing a lot of the overlapping techniques, et cetera. But then the energy cost is there if you're moving the data, right? You cannot say, oh, I didn't move the data. You did move the data and that took some energy. Okay, so the second one is what we've talked about earlier uh, in machine learning based prefetches. So you have a lot of data and metadata that's flowing through the system. Uh, make the system more intelligent by enabling to learn from that. So as opposed to designing rigid policies, rigid mechanisms, design systems that can learn from experience, right? Uh, humans are like that, right? We learn from experience. If we're smart enough, if our reward functions are optimized enough, let's say, we get better in making decisions over time, right? Hopefully. Uh, but machines are not like that in general, right? Like we looked at the caching policies. Uh, we look at the prefetching policies, except for the self-optimizing prefetchers that we discussed. They basically make heuristic-based decisions. These are decisions that are driven by humans. A human designer goes and says, oh, I think the access patterns will be like this, so let me design a rigid hardware structure that does this. But it's much better to actually design a hardware structure that's more flexible, that can learn over time. And this is where the power of machine learning can be used, uh, potentially, assuming the machine learning is good enough. There are also different issues in machine learning, of course. And what kind of machine learning can benefit this is important. So I think this is actually very interesting. And we saw an example of this in uh, prefetchers, right? We use reinforcement learning to improve prefetchers. And I believe you can apply similar principles uh, as well to many, many other things. This last one, we did not talk about much, but uh, I think it's also extremely important. Uh, so if we, uh, in this course, when we talked about data, we didn't talk about its semantic properties, right? If you think about data, we basically express it as an address. And then once you access that address, you get some data and you do something with it, right? Uh, a different way of thinking uh, says, the data that you're accessing is different. It has different semantic properties. It has different properties in terms of privacy. It has different properties in terms of security. It has different properties in terms of uh, fault tolerance. You get a bit flip in one data, you don't care because you're gonna display it on the screen and who cares one pixel is bad, right? Maybe I'll complain, but nobody's gonna take over my screen, uh, my, my system because one pixel in my video is bad, right? But some other data like the page table, that seems a little bit more uh, important in terms of security, right? So these semantic properties today, unfortunately, uh, don't get even discovered at the higher levels of the software stack. 
let alone get communicated to the hardware. So basically, the idea over here is if we can actually understand and exploit the different semantic properties of the data, we can actually do much better. We can protect the data much better, or we can process the data much better. Right? For example, if we can say, oh, this data can tolerate a lot of errors, let me put it in memory that has a lot of errors. Right? And this is very low cost memory, low energy memory, because it's not trying to keep the data intact. Right? So I can optimize the system to be much better that way. Right? And nobody gets hurt because I know that this data can tolerate a lot of errors. Right? Of course, you need to make that decision carefully. So this is the idea over here. If you can identify and distinguish different properties of data, you can actually make much, much better decisions in the system. So this is actually not being done as much today. It's, being, it's done a little bit when you talk about machine learning accelerators, for example, but not to the levels we're imagining. So that's what the paper you're reading is about, basically. It basically argues for a more data-centric system as opposed to doing everything in the processor. It argues for a more data-driven decision-making system as opposed to designers designing the policies and dictating them. And it argues also for a more data-aware or more properly data-characteristic-aware uh, system design as opposed to system design that do not know about the data. Right? I'll give you another example. Uh, people are worried about side channels today, right? By uh, when, uh, a side channel is a channel where you learn information about another program. Essentially, you see uh, how long the program's accesses take to some location, and you set up the problem such that if the program takes long, you basically figure out, figure out that the program is accessing bit one as opposed to bit zero, right? So of course, there's a lot more to go here. Uh, but basically, the fact that the program is taking a long time to access some location gives you an indication of what value it's accessing if you set up the side channel in a nice way. Now, if you actually know that a data that you're accessing is important and you should not expose it to side channels, maybe you protect that data from those side channels when it's flowing through the system. Right? It, you get to the memory controller, memory controllers try to access this data, and only this particular data, not everything in the system, this particular extremely important data, it accesses it slowly so that it doesn't expose any side channel, let's say. It doesn't have any other accesses going on while that, uh, uh, while that important data is being accessed. Right? If you do it for everything, the system will slow down significantly, clearly. But if you do it uh, in a very targeted way because you know the characteristics of the data, you can be much more efficient in this. So this is, I think, what a data aware system looks like, as opposed to treating everything equally, uh, treat things differently based on the, what, the, what they need in terms of their characteristics. Okay, so that's what we mean by this. And we do a lot of work in our research group in uh, these directions, essentially. And that's what the paper is about. So now you can actually summarize what I said as opposed to reading the paper, but reading the paper doesn't take that long as well. Okay, so I think I, I also like analogies like this. Uh, of course, we don't know how this thing works. Uh, I believe it's a compute engine, let's say. Uh, it's also a data storage engine. It's also a data communication engine, let's say. It's extremely energy efficient. We know that much, let's say. We also know that this is very different from the way we build processors. Basically, there's no central processing unit here. It's all distributed. Uh, the computation and communication and storage is done in an integrated fashion somehow where, where we don't completely understand things. There are different specialized parts specialized for different reasons. They may be uh, constructed using the same substrate, meaning the hardware, let's say, but they get specialized over time for somehow, right? Clearly, I'm not a neuroscientist. People who know this know better. I can give you a computational perspective. From the computational perspective, our computers resemble nothing like this, right? So this is why I think, uh, actually, this thing is probably more, uh, let's say, data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware. <laughs> All of these actually apply over here, in my opinion. Again, we don't know how it works. If we can actually figure out how it works, perhaps uh, there's a better way. People claim that there are some models for this, like spiking neural networks. There are some interesting things over there, like neuromorphic computing. I don't believe they actually completely explain the way this works, right? They explain some of the computational parts. Usually, they fall short on memory. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the sad part. <laughs> and memory is one of the most important things, as we know, right? Computational parts, OK, maybe. Maybe, even there, there may be, right? So I think understanding this actually can enable better machines. And actually, uh, building machines that are more in line with this thing may enable better understanding of that machine also, potentially, right? Uh, we'll see. We'll see how things evolve. OK, well, I put the slide over here for some reason. <laughs> Basically, this is uh, actually uh, the paper that you're, uh, you're reading is uh, you've already see, uh, seen a talk that covers some of the material in that paper. 
So it's going to be an easy extra credit. Let me see. So uh, I don't want to go over time also. Uh, we still have three minutes. So basically, uh, I think I've, I've given you these slides. Essentially, I think this is a great time to be a computer architect. We have a lot of problems and many big innovations require computer architecture today, uh, as you have seen. Uh, let me give you some more examples that you've seen already. These TPUs are very interesting, actually, but you know the limitations of it. There's another paper coming up at ISCA soon uh, that talks about uh, this TPUs, let's say, larger design. Essentially, they have some optical communication between the TPUs, which is interesting. Uh, the downside, I think, with a lot of these things is memory becomes a bottleneck. So here I'm going to be, again, a contrarian and say, don't forget the memory. Right? <laughs> I said, uh, research that looks at, let's say, how does the brain compute forgets the memory a little bit. We, we were able to explain computation using neurons, but we forget memory usually. We forget memory also in these compute units when we design them. So I think it's important to think about memory uh, a lot more going into the future. These folks, for example, thought about memory, but in a very expensive way. So it's, it's good that people are trying different, th different things, right? Uh, I don't know, has, has anyone figured out how much this costs? It's a lot, basically. Only the US government buys this, I think. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, don't, I hope they're doing good things with it. <laughs> but basically, uh, uh, this thing puts a lot of memory and a lot of computation together, but it's very expensive in the end. And as you can see, there are other things that are going on that are extending the traditional hierarchy in interesting ways uh, from a technology perspective, but from an architectural perspective, maybe it's not so interesting, right? Uh, because this is another cache that's added. And we clearly have this. So maybe this is, uh, well, the next one is a good slide to end with, maybe. But basically, we have a lot of other topics in computer architecture that we didn't cover. So we didn't touch, for example, uh, well, I guess we didn't touch most of this, right? Solid state disk, interconnection networks, multiprocessing, more distributed architectures, quality of service. We touched some of these things over here, but not everything. So never think that uh, this is the end of it. These are, some of these are covered in advanced architecture courses. So I showed you earlier the Oculus. Basically, we have an opportunity to build the Oculus going into the future in many fields. The question is, do you want to do that or do you want to do something else? Okay, I think I'm, I want to stop here. If you have questions, I can take it. Uh, but this is a good place to stop. Otherwise, the next stopping point will probably uh, take us 10 more minutes. It's always good to know which stops you can get off at also. Any questions, thoughts? Okay, so we don't have any more lectures. Uh, if you have any technical questions, you can certainly write on Moodle. I would suggest using Moodle to communicate with all of your classmates as well as the teaching team. And as I said, we're gonna release some material for uh, exam solving uh, questions. Some of these will be premiere. Some of these, uh, one of them may be actually a live session like we did last year. So there may be a live session of question solving also. But if you have questions, please ask them early. Don't wait until the week of the exam because that's a very difficult time for everyone in the end. Ask them early so that you can actually get them answered. Otherwise, don't expect an answer in the last day. Oh, we have the exam tomorrow. I have this question. The quality of service you get may not be very high. Any questions related to logistics or anything else? Okay, then we're done. I'll probably see you somewhere in later courses. Or if you want to do research, you can certainly contact us. But definitely come to the exam, I would say. Okay. Take care.